Liverpool. Yo, what's good, Knicks Nation? Welcome back to another Game of the Week preview. Of course, we've got to preview the series, man. we got the New York Knicks facing the Philadelphia 76ers. I know you were all probably like me watching that Sixers Heat game, wondering who would be the opponent, who would be the lucky team that gets to face the New York Knicks in this, in this first round matchup, all right? So we got the Sixers. That's who we draw. I'm ready for the Sixers. I'm sure you all are, too. And who better? to help break down this game. None of them, my gay guy, Dave Early, he covers the 76ers for Liberty Ballers, part of the SB Nation, so make sure to go check out his work there. Also, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe once again, and make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KSTV to get up to a $100 match. Let's get locked in. Let's get ready. Next playoff. Next playoffs, baby. Let's go. Let's go. I'm ready. Dave. My man, how What's you doing? Going on? How you feeling today? I'm feeling really good. Thank you for having me. I'm still riding high off that win. Uh, it, it felt improbable at times, but uh, like you said, the team that was lucky enough to play the Knicks and Paul Reed apparently agrees. Ha! Oh, Paul Reed talking spicy. I was just on as you. You actually were right on before me with Dexter Henry uh, today, talking talk on his show. And shout out to my guy. Uh, but Paul Reed talking spicy. Look, man, I, I, I'm from that era where it's like the stars got to talk spicy. Look, man, if you're just a guy averaging about three to four points, you know, like, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. You shouldn't be really talking that much. Paul Reed's pretty good. I think he's helpful. If Joel Embiid is limited, which we can get into, I think his lateral mobility might be useful. But you got to keep in mind, you remember that sort of like, wonky contract Danny Ainge drew up to hopefully screw the Sixers. Paul Reed's got eight million coming to him guaranteed if he escapes the first round. So it's hard to be mad at him for not wanting to play Boston. I think he likes his chances better against the Knicks as as I would have as a fan. I get that. I I I, I, I get that from but what Boston saying, but don't I I don't like this idea that everyone thinks that the Knicks are just some easy lucky draw. I don't like that. And I hope this is uh, bulletin board material for the rest of the team just to say, oh, Paul Reed thinks we're an easy team. We're a favorable matchup. Let's go get after it and just knock this team out. But hey, man. I mean, I was rooting hard for the Bulls because I wanted a piece of the Bucks when, while they're all banged up. Wanted no part of the Knicks once I saw how the other games were shaking out. It looked like the Sixers were going to be stuck in that seven heading into the postseason. And I'm guessing Paul Reed had the same rooting interest. He probably would have wanted a piece of a Giannis list bucks. Maybe Dame's got an abductor, adductor too. You know, who knows? I'd man. rather that than the Knicks. Hey, at least you're giving some uh, kudos to the Knicks. I, I appreciate Dave. I appreciate it. But hey, man, let's let's get into some of these storylines first because this is what the people are here for. They want to hear about what's going on, your viewpoints on the Knicks, and 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 viewpoints on the Sixers. So let me just start off with this question. Look, we've done many of these shows this season, man, where you and I are chopping up, breaking down these these games between the Knicks and the Sixers. Season's wrapped up, over. What do you think about the Knicks going into the postseason? They're good, man. They're good on both sides of the ball. I think they wound up, you know, top six in offense, top seven in defense, or with the top ten in both offensive rating and defensive rating, I believe. Um, it's hard to make sense – of both teams when you look at the ratings and the year-long stats because both teams have shifted quite a bit, as you know. Embiid missed more than half the season. Uh, I think it was around 12 games that Tyrese Maxey missed as well. 
He had one of those games against the Knicks this season without either of them. And from the Knicks side, you lose RG Barrett, you lose Manuel quickly, and then OG is out for a while with surgery, and now Randall's done. So if you look at the season-long stuff, it's hard to tell what you're going to get. But I do think now, to the point that we talked about on a prior pod, if you had reintroduced Randall, your ceiling is higher. There would have been immediate chemistry issues. Maybe now in the absolute short term, like just talking strictly game one versus the Sixers, maybe not having to deal with that could actually benefit them because you know exactly what you're going to get. OG being a low usage guy, you go heliocentric with JB. Um, so both teams have changed a lot over the year, but I think I like where the Knicks are at. They're, they're definitely a team to be feared and 20 and three with a noon to be in the lineup. That's what else do you say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with OG in the lineup, 20 and three, as you said, which is giving me, you know, confidence going into this matchup, especially where you have Hartenstein, Mitchell Robinson, and then OG, who, you know, as we saw in the first matchup after the OG and Anobi trade for the Knicks, you know, the double team definitely helped throw uh, and beat off his game. And then, of course, you see that OG is capable of guarding Maxi as well and being a disruptor there. But let's we'll stick on the Knicks for a little bit more. So, Knicks now in this postseason, what do you, what do you think of what do you think of I guess their chances make going on a deep run, based on how they're constructed? I like how the bracket has broke for the Knicks. Um, I think I wouldn't have been upset if they got the three seed as a fan, because you know maybe you uh, maybe you like your matchup a little bit better in the first round. If if we do think Giannis isn't going to play for the first few games of the series at least, um, but I like where they're at because I do think if you're really thinking deep run, you do want home court advantage for two series. Um, you get past the Sixers, assuming Joel Embiid looks, you know, if he looked forty percent of what he did in early December two nights ago, as we record. And now he's got two days off. Can he get to 50%, 60%? I mean, people are talking about 70%, 80%, but I didn't see anything like that against Miami. I know he delivered in the fourth, but he wasn't playing the same type of bully ball that we saw earlier we grew accustomed to. He was draining threes. He was making the right pass in the second half. Certainly wasn't making the right pass in the first half, but that's another story. But if you're going to get that guy, I do think the Knicks – will win the series. I'm not even positive Joel's going to be able to play every game this series. Me mm-hmm. and my buddy today were talking about, is there any chance that that thing swelled up on him and he's going to miss game one? Because we've seen it before as Sixers fans. Um, and, you know, from a strategy standpoint, then maybe you go all out for games two, three, and four with him mm-hmm. in the lineup, having bought him, you know, five days rest. I don't think they're going to do that. Joel's a gamer. He wants to be out. He'll have home court for that, too, as a Knicks fan. And all of a sudden, you're thinking deep run. You win game one against the Sixers, you have to be thinking conference finals in the back of your mind, even though you try to tell you what coaches say publicly one game at a time. Let's just enjoy this one. I hear you. Part of the fandom, you know, is always thinking ahead, looking, being excited for that next step, the next match with the next series. But Got to take it one game at a time. But you mentioned Joel Embiid having, you know, we, we saw yes, we saw yesterday against the Miami Heat. He was, you saw that lingering injury to his knee. You know that he landed awkwardly on it again as soon as he returned, coming back from an injury. What's your confidence in Joel Embiid being healthy for this series and, you know, being able to help the Sixers, let's just say, compete with the Knicks? My confidence that he'll be able to help them compete is very high. My confidence that he'll get to 80% of where he was when healthy. Last time I saw him healthy was probably Mm. mid-December. It was that January 5th game where the Knicks just came into Philly and blew the doors off them, right? Right. I think it was around that time. And Joel went into that game with a sore knee. I think this team had already scanned it by that point for swelling. Um, Maybe they were calling it soreness, tendonitis, whatever. And he caught some flack from not only fans, but I think Patrick Beverly too. For as soon as Pat Beverly was traded, he was like, "Here, they just care about winning." In Philly, a lot of guys were statistically minded, 
Uh, and Joel had that 30 and 10 streak at the time. He's limping around in garbage time in that Knicks game. That was the only time we saw these teams go at it with all their players in the lineup. Now, I'll caveat that Joel was clearly not right, and he only got worse after that, even though he dropped 70 against Victor. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, for Embiid, I think I just – this is where I'm, I guess, more confident for the Knicks because he doesn't look healthy, man. I mean, no. to be the reason why the Sixers were such a dominant force, not be afraid to really get physical. It just seems like he is shying away. Even some of the shots he was taking, like, you know, fadeaways, being around the mid range, free throw line. It just, it doesn't give me that same dominant Embiid, you know, power that he was at the so that's where, as a Knicks fan, I'm confident in the Knicks just being able to go in and win this series just because, you know, for the Knicks right now, they're, even though they don't have Randall, they're predominantly healthy, especially their guy who's been playing at an MVP level, M. Jalen Brunson. It's not the same for the Sixers. But I'm going to throw it back to you because last year was James Harden, right? James Harden, Joel Embiid take the Sixers to the second round, lose to the Celtics in a, in a series that I thought they should have had. You had to go there? <laughs> yeah, hey, man, I got to bring up, I got to bring up past, you know, as Knicks fans, this is what we have to deal with, right? You know, <laughs> everyone's like, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this. I get that. But I got to do it for Sixers fans too because, hey, why not? You're here right now, I got to, you know, just, it's fun, man. It's fun. But anyway, you had James Harden last year. You don't have him this season. Instead, you have, in my opinion, a better player in Tyrese Maxey. Do you believe Tyrese is ready to take that next level in this at this stage of his career and help carry this team? Because since Joel is not healthy, you're going to need his running mate to be the number two option and to do some of the heavy lifting in, in this series. Yeah, I certainly think he's ready. I think he's made that leap consistently enough this year. I expect him to win most improved player, although I've heard good cases for a couple other guys. I think you could make a good case for two players on the Knicks, including Jalen Brunson, who, I mean, I know he finished, what, top 12 in MVP voting last year, so he's probably not going to get much consideration. But even he improved his bag, right? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously DDV. But I do think Max can win, and I do think he has an outside all-NBA third-team shot here. As a number two, yeah, I, I think the, for the Sixers to win the series, they'll need Joel Embiid to be the number one. I'm not certain that they'll need him to be the best player in the series because if we're penciling in Brunson, knowing Joel is not quite right as the best player in the series, which isn't a completely safe bet. I mean, Joel could return at 85% and just dominate. We've seen stuff like that before from him. But uh, if he if he could give you 85%, I think then the rest would be on Maxi for the Sixers to pull it out. And I do think he's capable of that. I mean, going back to Kentucky – Going back to his rookie year, you remember when Ben Simmons was having some struggles. He couldn't make a free throw. The Sixers had choked away like a 24-point lead in the fourth against the Hawks in 2021. In the sixth game on the ropes, down 3-2, they just threw Maxi in there, and he, he was a gamer. Um, he's had big games on the road in big spots. He plays pretty fearlessly, uh, as a lot of Kentucky products do. So... I think I don't think the MSG lights will be too bright for him. Where I would worry is you mentioned James Harden and Daryl Morey talked about this on Wright's Ricky Sanchez pod a day or two ago. He's not the playmaker James is. He doesn't make life easier for everyone else around him. He's a dynamic scorer. He's awesome in transition. But if you are getting bogged down against a Tib defense, that's when you need someone who can create in the half court and Harden could do that. The offense stagnates. You remember how predictable the 23 Sixers looked against Boston. This team is a lot more unpredictable. I mean, one night it's Kelly Oubre. One night it's Nick Batum. Um, you remember that game? Batum went into the garden. That crazy game. There was no Maxi. There was no Embiid. Yep. And it was 79-73. Yeah, and two Oubre. seasons ago. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> this last year. Last season. That was last season. No, no, this March. This March. Was it this, mar this was March? This March? Yeah, Ubre had 18 and 10 in a 79-73 oh, win. That game. 
two nights before the Knicks won by like 50. You, you know what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking about Batum on the Clippers where he hit that game winner. That's what I'm thinking of, which is last okay. season. But now, uh, I, but now, I swapped to Ubre. My bad, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries, no worries. I get it. But yeah, no, the Sixers team is very unpredictable, which is, you know, in, in a way, you know who the stars are and you need though that unpredictability. You don't necessarily need that unpredictability, but you will have that unpredictability based on the role players. And I think that goes the same thing, same way for the New York Knicks, man. It like, does. You don't know who is going to be that guy game in and game out who's going to help Brunson be a score. You know, we can count on role players to do the certain things. Like I could say Josh Hart's going to be a rebounder. Dante's yeah. going to put up threes. Isaiah Hartenstein's going to be a good uh, paint presence. Mitch is going to be a good rim protector. McBride's going to give you good point of attack defense and knock down some threes. But who's going to be that guy to be the next scorer on this team when needed? And that's why Brunson just has crazy numbers to end this, the last 10 games of the season because he's had to put up 30, 40 point games in order to help this team win, which, you know, has his pluses and minuses, but the unpredictability, which is why it's also another fair matchup, in my opinion, between the Knicks and the Sixers and an interesting one. I don't like, like I said, I'm confident in the Knicks, but it's still going to be, it's not going to be like the Knicks walk in and then, you know, 10, 20 point victory. This is going to come down to a possession battle between the Sixers, which it will be interesting. So, I'm looking forward to that. But salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all for tuning in for another game of the week preview. With me on the other side is my guy, Dave Early. He covers the Sixers for Liberty Ballers, part of the SB Nation Network. Make sure to go check out his work there. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. And salute to the franchise channel members in here right now. Shout, shout out to John Talento. Shout out to JJ. Shout out to G5 Wheeze. We got all you in here. We got all the regulars in here. Shout out to the Shells. Shout out to you. Shout out to Reek Flair. Shout out to Two Lifted. Shout out to Jamaica Queens. Shout out to Wise Guy. Shout out to my guy TM. Don't worry, TM. I got you. I got you. I, I was saving you for last. The Chief Mod and Operations got to always give TM a shout out. Man, you forget to shout him out once and you get, you get blasted. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, moving along. We talk about this go going to be a defensive. I feel like this is going to be a defensive matchup, and so fitting that we have, uh, so fitting that it's Tom Thibodeau against Nick Nurse. Who, when I preview the these games with uh, Will Lou, who covers the Raptors, and when Nick Nurse was out in Toronto, the the phrase for the Toronto Raptors fans is that it was Nick Thibodeau. So it looks like Tom Thibodeau is facing Tom Thibodeau which should be an interesting matchup schematically, you know, especially from the defensive side. What do you make of these two teams coming in to this matchup defensively? The Sixers defense has looked really good since Joel returned. Um, the offense has been a little sputtery. There's a lack of, I mean, and B has spoken about it publicly. He said stuff like the conditioning is big, you know, it took a toll on him to get hurt this time. And then the processing isn't quite there. And you saw that with all the turnovers in the first half against Miami. You saw that in a few of those games that he appeared in late in the season. His his processing to use the the process pawn just was off. He, he waits with three guys on him and he just kind of holds it when you're looking. You're just saying, just swing it. I mean, Maxie's already hit two in a row. Just swing the ball. Swing, swing. There's a guy open in the corner. And he holds it and takes a tough shot. Um, so I'm a little worried about that. And I do think, obviously, if you give Tibbs a four to seven game series, he's going to figure something out defensively. Will he get as exotic and creative as Spolstra did with that 3-2 web or whatever that was they used? If I were him, I'd at least consider a little bit of it because I think while the Sixers picked it apart in the second half, started draining shots, it definitely seemed to throw them. Uh, it seemed to close off the lanes that Maxi had. There's been some games we've seen without Embiid where Maxi has a lot of trouble beating the Knicks. I mean, you've seen that. But when Embiid is out there, they're getting stops, and he gets those transition looks. He finds a rhythm he's a lot harder to contain. So, you know, there, there's a really fun matchup on both sides of the ball with Brunson and Maxi, and... 
I don't think the Sixers have a great answer for Brunson if anyone in the NBA does the way he's playing right now. Maybe you throw some bigger bodies at him, Batum, Oubre, and then you hit him with Kyle Lowry and see if you could change a little bit. And on the other hand, I think if the Knicks can cut off some of those lanes, I mean, you got studs defensively. You've got OG who could pretty much cover anyone, especially if Joe's not going to be banging down low. If he's going to be spotting up like he did against Miami, you could put OG on him a lot, assuming he doesn't get in foul trouble. I saw someone post on Twitter some of the numbers against OG specifically, uh, and he wasn't he wasn't picking up too many fouls. You throw hard at Maxi, you throw Deuce at Maxi, you throw DDV out there. Uh, you, you got a lot of options. So yeah, I think you're right. I think defense is going to be the key, as we would probably expect from one of the best Knicks teams since like what, 94, 95, 99? 40, you said, what, 44, 99, okay. No, no, I was saying, this is kind of a great defensive team in the playoffs is what you would expect from one of the best Knicks teams since maybe what year? 95, 94? Oh, okay, 99? I see what you're saying, I see what you're saying. Um, I would say that this is the best defensively, no, no, just best Knicks team. Where would you where would you rank? Oh, them? best Knicks team? In, in mm. like basically our generation, our lifetimes. Probably like nineties. It's tough because it's definitely still better than very the early. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough because it's still it's still it's still early. They can lose round one and then we'll like, say No, it's not necessarily it's not necessarily like lose round one. It's like it's 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 still early because the '90s was a stretch, right? Like we're talking about, uh, we're talking about legitimately the '90s was they were dominant for a time period. The Knicks are starting. Yeah. Let's see, you had I guess Randall's here in 1920, so you had 2021, down year in 21, 22, 23, 24. The Knicks are on the path to doing something for the the 20s, if you think about it, if yeah. they can keep up this consistency. So then, yeah, I would say if they could finish off this decade just being in the playoffs, it would be very much comparable to that nineties team just for the consistency of success. I love the mellow team, mellow team. They did it. You know, they went to the playoffs three times, one 50, it was a 52, 54 wins. They did that year, uh, second in the East, but that was just once. And that was a really good team too. But I think if you're talking about consistency, it's probably the nineties. Just like inconsistent base. Yeah, so the 90s team was better. I mean, they went to the finals. They had Ewing. But could this team beat the 99 squad that had that magical eighth seed run with Spree and H2O? I don't know. I'm just curious. Whatever. We can move back to the Sixers. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a good question to think about. Like, I think they could, they could have that magical run. I mean, as we already talked about, the pathway is already there for how – the Knicks could make it to that that distance. Like they gotta get past the Sixers first. So if the, if they get past the Sixers, things start to open up a little bit more. And then you see Boston at the end of that that tunnel as uh the Eastern Conference Finals uh, opponent. So we'll see, yeah. man. We'll see, we'll see how that works. But I guess throwing it back to you for for Nick Nurse, what have you seen from him that gives you confidence in this series that you know that he's always gonna have an adjustment, the best lineup out there and everything else. Yeah. I don't agree with, uh, with Will from the raps. Uh, I haven't seen Nick Tabato. I I've seen, I, you know, I know where that came from because the post Kawhi years, there was no more load management. He was scrapping by, to get to the play. And he always despaired. He has done some of that this year. I mean, you could argue that Joel was overplayed in January before he got hurt. And you could argue that Tyrese Maxey, was overplayed as he picked up a hip issue. Um, but he also went pretty deep with his lineups. And what I love about him, especially compared to Doc, is that he makes adjustments week to week, game to game, half to half, quarter to quarter. I mean, he's constantly throwing things out there to see what sticks. And you saw that against Miami in the biggest game of the year. They had no chance against that zone in the first half. And Albeit Jimmy Butler got hurt, and Miami probably wins that game had he not. He's already half teasing Kelly Oubre, saying we got to throw him. Nick Nurse because and being able to take you out of your comfort zone as an offense. 
I think Neris is a little bit more like to win a chess match if Joel Embiid is healthy enough to allow him to play one. Mm. Okay. I I don't know, man. I, I, I would usually typically agree with that, but Tibbs has really adjusted this season, which has really impressed me. I think the one thing that I see fans are wondering is if Tibbs will deploy a zone as I don't think he's going to just run something different that he hasn't really been practicing or implementing throughout the regular season. But the one thing I will say is that offensively, it has been creative to incorporate more ball movement. So yeah. I think on the offensive side, you got to give him credit there. And yeah. I think if, if nurse is going to be creative defensively, I am shocked to be saying this. I think Tibbs could be a little more creative on the offensive side to get guys a little bit more better open looks just based on ball movement and some of the actions that he's been implementing. Tibbs now has, and I was talking to about this with uh, Andrew Claudio over at Nick's home school is that Tibbs now has his set of guys. So we're now seeing small ball lineups. We're starting to see mm -hmm. him just deploy different things that he never used to do with previous rosters that he had with this team. So because of that, I can actually say I think he'll be a little bit more open to trying and running things out. I mean, even – so – Were you I think, impressed when he uh, when he took Alec Burks out there against Brooklyn with the two seed on the line? I was more impressed that he didn't run Alec Burks into the ground and that Burks <laughs> is now on the bench uh, rightfully where he should be. So that is where I'll say, hey, Tibbs is adjusting and, and you know, on making, the fly, the, on the making the stuff that needs to – making the making the adjustments that needs to occur. So I'll give Tibbs, you know, like I said, in the past I probably would have, but this season I think, you know, Nick Nurse, Tom Tibbet, it'll be an interesting chess match. So I'm it's looking forward to yeah, that. Well. Looking forward to how this all plays out. But once again, salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. With me on the other side is my guy, Dave Earl. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. And had to make sure I had this one ready. So Daniel, KFTV at underdogfantasy.com. You could win two tickets to the game this Saturday for a special giveaway. So make sure to go over to Underdog Fantasy, use that promo code KFTV, and make sure to get not only up to 100 between the Knicks and the Philadelphia 76ers this weekend. So make sure to sign up if you haven't done so already. And look, while you're also there, use the app. It's fun. I like using it. I like using the app, especially when watching games, just because it just makes it that much more interesting. And you don't have to just choose the NBA. You can choose any sport, NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL. You got baseball, hockey, and, and, and basketball all in season right now. So you don't have to just choose one sport. You can choose players from different sport, different leagues, different sports, and make a ticket between two to five players. And all you got to do is choose higher or lower for a statistical category that you believe that player is going to hit. So, for example, let's say I chose Jalen Brunson, and let's say they had it set at 32 and a half, higher or lower. I'd probably go higher than 32 and a half because Jalen Brunson has been doing just that throughout the last 10 games. And if I hit on that, it would just improve my ticket to win some earnings. So make sure to go download the app. Use under use that promo code KFTV for Underdog Fantasy to get up to a one hundred dollar match. And look, if you don't like the pickums, you can also do the draft, which is also a lot of fun as well. And look, you know, I, CP JD, uh, the Knicks chick CK, and myself, we've all been enjoying it. It's a nice, friendly way to have some competition and get some lunch money. So, highly recommend that. Support our sponsor. Use that promo code once again, KFTV, to get up to a $100 match and sign up for Underdog Fantasy, as it says in this banner, to make sure to win, two, to try and win, I should say, try and win two tickets to the game one at Madison Square Garden between the Knicks and the 76ers. So make sure to go do that at underdogfantasy.com. All right. Let's get into game one matchup, Dave. Let's get into game one matchup. You know, these two teams have a lot of common, as we already discussed. They got two guys in MVP consideration. These guys, you know, have role players that you don't know who's going to show up on whatever day. Uh, these two teams have defensive-minded head coaches. They like to focus on defense as well. And another area where they're very much in common is their rebounding. Even though the Knicks are ranked 
fifth in the league in rebounding, even though the Knicks are ranked fifth in rebounding right now. It is uh, not too far from where the Sixers rank, which is, I should trunk. say, and how they produce. Put them in the what? Even though the Sixers are ranked 20th, Put Knicks are averaging trunk. 45 boards, Sixers are averaging 43. I think a big part of this matchup is going to be who controls the glass. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's that's got me worried as a Sixers fan. Uh, the offensive glass. I mean, I think the Knicks lead the league in offensive boards, right? Yep. It's clearly been a priority. I know analytics nerds on Twitter. I followed some of the debates. Is it better to crash the glass? Is it better to get back on D? What wins? And probably it depends on your personnel. If you've got guys like Kartenstein, you know, um, and Josh Hart. Like, Josh Hart is such an X factor because when he makes a play, the garden erupts. And that doesn't help a road team. And I think that has a tendency to also influence the way the referees initiate a game. If they see the Knicks hit a big three, the crowd's going nuts. Maybe they're more likely to get another call, too. That works on the road for the other team as well. And if you have a guy like Hart who could get the home crowd going, that's a big deal. Rebounds is going to be a huge part of this because both teams are going to want to run. If the Sixers want to play their game, they're getting stops and they're letting Maxi get out there. And and B doesn't even have to make it to half court half the time because Ubre is finishing on a lob that Maxi ignited because Embiid got the stop. And on the other end, if the Sixers, if the Knicks see that Joel is not quite right, they're going to want to get stops. They're going to want to run his butt off and see how much he can do. And then when the game slows down into the half court, they're probably going to want to run a lot of those high screen and rolls between JB and iHeart, space out the floor, force a player like Embiid to come way out to protect the rim. Otherwise, you're giving up the pull up around that screen to JB, and you don't want to do that. He, if yeah, Joel I... does come out too far, JB slinks into the lane, and it's a floater, a layup, free throws, or a kick out to the corner. Yeah. Uh, and look, I think JB is going to look very much so to attack the paint. And I, that, and like, that's where their success has been. And that's where, you know, you have guys like Hartenstein, not Hartenstein, but Josh Hart, who have really thrived against the Philadelphia 76ers by being able to attack the lane. I mean, he's averaging 48% from the field when, when going against the Sixers this season, averaging 14 points, he's he averaging 14 this. boards as well. He's a critical factor. So not only will JB, but Josh Hart will make sure to you know, get down the lane and see if they could find some of the open guys to make sure that Sixers defense just stays on their toes and it's constantly rotating because this whole thing is about driving, kicking, and looking for guys open on the perimeter, knock down some three. So it'll be interesting to see how the Knicks it'll be interesting to see how the Knicks get, I guess, not 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 get into rhythm, but just if they're able to constantly do that and how Nick Nurse is able to adjust against that, right? Because throughout a seven game series, you start to learn your opponent's tendencies and you're trying to take that away. So it's always going to be the counter to the counter that will fascinate me in this series because these two teams are just very similar. What do you think the counter to the counter will be from Sixers and defending JB? When you think of all the games that you've watched this season, was there one team that defended him a particular way that was more effective? It was my... It was Miami in the most recent game. Yeah. It was Miami in the most recent game. And between blitzing, double teaming, um, it's always spoke. You no know, zone. But the thing is that the Knicks are a better shooting team this year. So I don't know if the zone will necessarily work. The reason why it worked in that game against Miami is because nobody else was able to hit a shot. And so yeah. that's why it's so critical in this for this team, for this Knicks team that guys just knock down open shots because if they're not, it's just going to make it that much easier for defenses to just not, not necessarily hone in on Brunson, but just to hone in on everybody else and force Brunson to be that savior, which, you know, he can't score a hundred points. I mean, I'd be very impressed if he did that, but <laughs> that's, that would, that's essentially what it would come down to if Josh or Dante are not knocking down their open threes. He'd get a statue the same size as Allen Iverson's right away. Good war, man. Can we talk about that for a second? Sure. What is with the small statues? 
Well, the I know they're outside the training facility, but what is what is with the small statues? The statue was revealed and it looked small. The defense there is they're all drawn, they're all you know made to scale, and all the other ones are up in the air. You know, you had to have Moses rebounding, Barkley dunking, Dr. J's the dunk. So they're up the ball is up over 10 feet. So in Dr. J at six nine, whatever it is, stands next to it, it's it's way bigger than he is. And that looks pretty cool. And then mm. Iverson, when he does a crossover, he's a six foot man who gets down low, like you know, like um, a running back to look, get your pads low, and imagine covering him. So I, I guess that's what they would say. But well, maybe they should have just then made the base a little taller or something. Either way, you wanted it to. I think he's the only one who got one that was shorter than himself. Mm. All the other I... guys, you know, I think that's why it looked funny, but. In their defense, it was all to scale, so whatever. Disrespectful, man. Disrespectful. <laughs> Good lord. It was Good a it was lord. a funny image, and especially when he rubbed it on the head and the replies were like, he said good little buddy to the statue. Yeah, exactly. That's one thing. It's like, oh, that's a good little guy right Wait there. Wait till Come Embiid on. gets his, he'll be crouching, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> oh, good lord. Oh man. But getting back on track. <laughs> I think a big key, key statistical area in the last through the last ten games that could be in favor for the Sixers is their ability to attack out and, and transition. You know their fast break uh, points uh, is just is just real has been really good, man. They're averaging seventeen points off of fast breaks throughout these last ten games. They're averaging they're I should not say they're averaging they're fifth in the league right now. And then you look at what the Knicks are capable of doing on the defensive side. The Knicks rank ninth when it comes to limiting fast break points. They're limiting points to 13. This is where I think it's going to be a clash because if the Knicks can limit the Sixers in their transition scoring, especially with a hobbled and bead, and that's where Maxi likes to thrive, then I'm looking at this series going in the favor of the Knicks. I think this is going to be a big area to look at between both teams. Yeah, the, I, aren't the Knicks ranked like last in pace? So they might want to really change that for this one. Um, we talked about Tibbs adapting. If I were them, I would look to increase that pace because you want to move. And in order to get – it's it's all this feedback loops. In order to get out in transition, you got to get the stop first because if you're pulling the ball out of the net and inbounding it, they're already back. So you, mm -hmm. everyone's going to want to get the stops and everyone's going to want to run. Both teams are going to want that desperately. So it's going to come down to that defensive chess match that we talked about at the start. For sure, for sure. But there's no bigger chess match than what we're going to have to watch between Isaiah Hartenstein and Joel Embiid. Because to me, this is the key matchup of the game, Dave, because Joel Embiid... MVP type caliber player. I mean, this season alone, he's averaging 35 points, 11 boards, just a double double machine, close to six assists, shooting 53% from the field, 39% from downtown, and 88% from the free throw line. Now, Hartenstein not doing similar numbers as that, but he has been solid defensively, which won't show up in this stat sheet. Regardless, I'm going to read off his numbers. This season, Hartenstein is averaging eight points eight boards, getting you close to three assists, shooting 65% from the field, hitting 33% from downtown, which is, yeah, I don't think he's taking that much that, this season. And he's shooting 71% from the free throw line. But the thing that Hartenstein's going to offer is his facilitating, which doesn't fully show up in the stat sheet, and his defensive presence. He's really stepped up since Mitchell Robinson went down with an injury. Even with Mitch back, Hartenstein is still in the starting lineup and still giving the Knicks that paint and rim protect that paint protection and that rim protection that is certainly needed for a Tom Thibodeau defense. Hartenstein is going to be so critical in slowing down Joel Embiid because if Joel Embiid is able to get going, which you know that's what Philadelphia tried to do against Miami and didn't have a lot of success, but if Embiid is able to get into a groove and be the guy that he is capable of being, it will be difficult for this Knicks team to stop. But this is where I think Hardenstein is going to be key, and that's why he is part of my key matchup in this series. What do you think about this key matchup? 
Yeah, Hart- we talked about Paul Reed. Hartenstein talked a little bit of trash. A I, tad I bit today. Not, yeah, not like not Paul Reed saying we want this. We want the Knicks. No, no, he he hit back Paul Reed and said, "Guys, get comfy on pods," and they say some shit, whatever. And then when he talked about Embiid, he said he'll be looking for fouls. He likes to get those little breaks. And I think knowing Embiid and knowing you know when people were trashing the process, he took that very personally. He he felt like they were trashing me. And he's got that drive that a lot of the top stars do where if it were you and I, we would say, you know, come on, dude, you're being sensitive. But with these guys, it's no, I'm feeling that and I'm in the lab and I'm like, I'm like Kobe Bryant trying to do vice grip squeezes to get my hands as strong as Jordan's were. And I think Joel has that. And so I think he would be offended that we're even having this conversation about Isaiah Hartenstein, because if this were earlier in the season, he'd be like, who? Mm. Um, the ringer has him ranked the top 15th center in the league right now. Where would you, where do you have them roughly? They've uh, got are you guys about like, yeah, they've got guys like miles Turner, Jared Allen, Shangoon, um, Victor. Sabonis. Well, I would put him, I don't think Jared Allen should be so high. I am still waiting for Jared Allen to be, you know, something in the playoffs. I mean, we yeah, had Mitchell Robinson and Isaiah Hartenstein just make light work of the Twin Towers in Cleveland. So anytime I see one of those centers just higher than one of our guys, I think it's downright just wrong. Um, yeah, after the first round last year, the, those two just, you know, looked ineffective. Exactly. So that's why I don't think – I think there's a lot of potential and hope when it comes to those rankings for Jared Allen, guys cutting back door, looking for guys who are open on the perimeter to knock down threes. I mean, his facilitating opens up the Knicks' offense just so much that he's so valuable to what this team does. And I think his value, like 15 is probably about right because I do believe he's a starting center in this league just from what he's demonstrated for half the season. I mean, he's playing. He, did a, he, he turned around last season after having a poor start and not looking like he could fit on this roster, and then did just that. And now this season has really taken to another level, and he's always willing to, you know, risk his body for, like, walks. Yeah. He's, you just see that he's always willing to, you know, battle out there. I think that's got to be respected, too. When you, when you, when you, yeah, when you consider the value of playing the center position. So I think, I think top player. 15 is, is solid just because this is his first time really getting a starting role after being in the league for so many. I know JB takes most of the credit for getting this team to 50 wins, but you got to give Arnstein credit too for helping this team get to 50 wins because defensively and even on the offensive side, he has been impactful. So got to give him kudos there. Yeah, you called it when we had a conversation about a matchup in January and you talked about him being the key. I predicted the Sixers were win, would win and they lost by like 30 and uh, I heart was was awesome in that game. I was very impressed. So if he can make an impact, if Joel is not 100%, then it's going to be advantage mix for sure. If Joel can work on the block and spin and twist and fade and get the jumper going, maybe he gets in foul trouble. You got to rely on someone else there. Um, you know, is Mitchell Robinson going to give you minutes that are as effective? That that could change the game for sure. But if Joel Embiid is spotting up, you know, Rook Lopez is a guy that plays him right now as well as anyone else. And it reminds me of when Marc Gasol used to play Joel. He's a big body on one end, and he knows all the tricks. He doesn't get back down very easily. And on the other end, he plays pretty far away from the basket quite a bit because even if he's not a terrible threat to hit a three, he's a great threat to set a screen for a guy who might, and you got to be there to help. For sure. For sure. Now we're talking about guys who, you know, who are going to make an impact that, you know, aren't, you know, the main guys or the main focal points. And sometimes you got to go to the bench and figure out who are going to be the bench players to make that type of jump or change the outcome of a game. And I'm looking at another than Boyan Bogdanovich for this next team, man. That's he's my X factor for this matchup, just because when you look at needing more offense, this guy's been a bona fide starter throughout the league for most of his career. Now being on the Knicks, coming off the bench, um, coming from a Pistons team that was just downright awful. He is so important because when you look at 
uh, second unit lineup of McBride, Josh Hart, OG, uh, you know, Mitchell Robinson, or even if you have Precious Achua out there, you need somebody who can create their own shot. And Bogey is the guy who can do that. And so he's shown that he is taking the right step, taking the step in the right direction towards the end of the season and looking like the guy that we traded for that we're hoping for that can give us some instant offense off the bench. But in this matchup, this series, he's going to have to continue to do that because we're going to need a guy off the bench to continue to help, especially in those non Brunson minutes. We're going to need someone out there who can score and bogey is going to have to be that guy, especially what we see that he's able to work from the post mid range, knock down some jumpers Gotta be better about some threes, man, because you, you're missing some wide open threes. But hey, this guy is gonna be—he's he, gonna be the X factor for the Knicks if they're gonna get out of this series as well. Because you're gonna need his instant offense. I like it. I like it. Yeah, he worries me because he's a smart, talented veteran. He's been around. A lot of people thought he was the best player traded at the deadline, right up there with Buddy Heald. Um, another potential X factor for us. And there are gonna be open shots, and if he's out there, he's going to be a guy that commands gravity and given his savvy um i think he could hurt the sixers in some certain spots who is who would you be your x factor for the sixers in this in the series and matchup for game one i would have said that this was a, a cliche at one point in the past but i'm gonna <laughs> but i have to say it's tobias harris here because kelly Oubre to me is played consistently well enough. And I will add that mm. I, I may have detected a slight. I don't know if you heard me talk to Dexter about this. I may have detected a slight from Tibbs who said, he was asked earlier who he's worried about and he rattled off a whole bunch of names and he never once said Kelly. And I thought that's odd. Kelly led the Sixers to a win in the garden, the game where DDV tackled them. Is there something going on there or did he just not think of them in the moment? because he named Lowry, Batum, Harris. And Harris has been playing much more poorly than KO lately. And we've had a few nights where we've said, hey, that's good, Toby. And then in a critical matchup with everything on the line, I mean, <laughs> he's not hitting the rim. So mm. if you were Nick Nurse, would you honestly consider starting Batum or do you just leave it what it is and then just rearrange the minutes so that Batum gets more when he deserves it? Because right now, Batum is the much better player than Harris. And, and I mean, Ubre, too. I mean, Batum was the big reason why the Sixers moved on from the play and are now at the seventh seed. Doc Rivers would have ridden with Toby, and it wouldn't have worked. That I know. Mm. And that's why Doc is out of a job <laughs> in Philadelphia. And, you know, this is why the Bucks look like the way they do. Uh, yeah, Anywho, they need Adrian Griffin back. You're going with... You're going with... So you're going with Tobias Harris, which is a fair is a fair choice. I do like that pick because one, as you noted, he hasn't been, he has been playing poorly, but he is essentially that third guy. And if you're playing poorly and you're the third, you're suppo the supposed third guy on this roster, you, you do need to show up. And I, you're giving me the look like he shouldn't be the third guy and isn't the third guy. He hasn't been for quite some time at this point. I have to say, I mean, he should be based on his salary, but I've let that go a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, when they, when they let Butler go, giving him 180 million was devastating. If they had kept Butler, I could have stomached it because if you got Joel, if you have Ben Simmons, maybe you traded him for Harden, maybe you even had JJ Redick at one point, or you could find yourself a buddy healed type. If he could be your fourth or fifth best guy, now you've got something. But when you need him to be your second guy, that doesn't work. And he hasn't been able to be consistently the third best guy in big moments. I mean, I trust certainly trust, like I said, guys like Lowry to Ubre more over him at this point. And I would probably rather see Buddy out there. Um, the one, the one caveat I'll give to that is we talked how important rebounding is going to be because both teams want to get out in transition, and Harris is a fairly good rebounder. He's one of the Sixers' better rebounders. So he does present some matchup problems too because if you're putting OG on someone really dangerous, if you want to put OG on Maxi or Joel at times, if you want to put him on Kelly who can score in the half court, 
there's a good chance Toby's going to have a mismatch that he might be able to exploit. Now, if I were Tibbs, I might say, hey, if they want to isolate Harris, let them do that all game long. Give him 100 shots on, on JB. I'll take it. So then, Dave, we just broke down the game. We just broke down game one. We talked about the series. Let's talk about how we think this matchup is going to go. Do you think... I, I guess... I'm so I I guess who do you think wins game one? And I'm going to ask you the series. So who do you think wins game one? I think the the Knicks win game one. Okay. I think the, I think the the Sixers left a lot out there against Miami. If you thought about this like a seven game series, you win game seven, you got two days, and you go play game one. You often lose that game. It feels like, doesn't it? So I, I like the Knicks in game one. I do see that they're favored by two and a half. So Vegas, Vegas expects a close game. Um. Vegas oddly has the Sixers as favored in the series despite losing game one um, on DraftKings, at least. And they've mm. got like twice, twice as twice better odds to win the championship as the Knicks, like plus 1900 versus plus 4000. So I guess the way they're looking at it is like the Knicks might win this series, but they don't have a great chance to win the championship without Julius Randle out there. If the Sixers could get healthy, maybe they could at least make a big run. They have the best player. They have a player who could win a finals MVP, and they have a guy in Maxi who could be the second best player on a title team. Could be how they're looking at it. My pick is the Knicks because I don't know what Joel's going to look like. I don't even know if he's going to play every game. If you promised me he was going to be at 80%, I would take the Sixers and seven. Okay. So I'm going to take the Knicks to win game one. I'm going to take the Knicks to win in six. I just think because Embiid doesn't look healthy and you're relying on him to, you know, recover while playing playoff basketball, which isn't, you're not managing minutes at this point. You got to play as much as you can. And we just saw he had to go through the plan. Now it's just more wear and tear without being able to get the conditioning. I'm taking the Knicks to win this game one. I'm also taking the Knicks to win this series. Also, Paul Reed gave some bulletin board material. So that's what I'm going with too. But I like, I, I agree with you. And I would say that, I think if in order for the Sixers to win this series, they're going to need to win two games in MSG because I don't know that they're going to be able to win every single game in Philly, especially if if the Bing Bong Wild crazies are going to take the. All one right, Bing Bong is done. We're not talking Bing Bong. All right, we're done with the Bing. We're <laughs> if, done. If, New, if New York Forever is going to make the trek one and a half hours up the turnpike, down the turnpike, I think there's going to be some loud uh, loud Knicks fans in Philly. I, I I hope so, man. I hope so. Uh, and everyone, be careful when you travel down to Philly because we all know how Philly fans are. Anywho, Dave, I appreciate you coming through and previewing this game with me. Please let the listeners know where they can find you if you got any work that we should be on the lookout for. Uh, you can find me at libertyballers.com on Twitter at David Early, spelled like early morning. There you go. Dave, appreciate you for coming through again. And to Knicks Nation, thank you once again for coming through for another Game of the Week preview to preview the New York Knicks facing the Philadelphia 76ers this Saturday, 6 p.m. at Madison Square Garden. All right. Thank you all for tuning in once again. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And make sure to sign up. For Underdog Fantasy, using that promo code KFTV. And remember what happens when you do. If you go to underdogfantasy.com, sign up using the promo code KFTV, you get a chance to win two tickets to game one this weekend to watch the Knicks take on the Philadelphia 76ers. So make sure not to miss out on that. Once again, go to underdogfantasy.com, use that promo code KFTV, and you can potentially win two tickets to game one this weekend. So make sure to do that. Make sure to also support our writers over at KnicksFanTV.com. Salute to all the franchise channel members once again for coming through. And also I got to give some shout outs to some super chats that we see. All right. So I want to give a shout out to Devin Sima. He says 76ers fans really putting their faith in a dude named Tobias. Mr. Crumble Cookie is finished. Knicks info. There we go. Sounds like a Sixers fan. <laughs> we got Frankie Bricks, who just became a franchise channel member. Shout out to you as well. Also, shout out to Dark Knight 848 for the $5 super chat. He says, What's up, Alex? Longtime listener. 
Now that we got 50 wins with an injured team, is 50 the new standard? I mean, it's hard to say that because each season's different, but I do expect this team to win many games season in, seasons in and seasons out because got of all your showed. picks. Huh? We got all the got picks. All your picks. You did it without Randall. You did it without Mitch. You did it without OG. I expect this team to win many games every season to always be in the playoffs. I don't expect playing or nothing. That's that's essential. That's essentially my standard. It's not necessarily the number of wins. They just got to be top six year in and year out, and that's what they've proven to do since under Tom Thibodeau. So that's my expectation for this team. But once again, salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. We got it. Don't worry. We got post game obviously happening after they play, and I'm pretty sure we got another show tomorrow. Make sure to tune in then. We'll catch you later. We out.